I'm Miss Barbara, and I'm glad to see that you're here with me. I'm glad you're making time for Jesus. And God is always glad that you are making time for him. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday. I know that it's a fall day and there are lots of things that you'd rather be doing. But I'm glad that you're taking time to learn more about your Bible and more about God and more about all the things that Jesus taught us how to do when he came here to earth. Thank you. So how about we start off today's lesson as we normally do with the Bible verse. So listen along as Lola Grace reads us the verse today. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be risen up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk on his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction of and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Micah 412. Thank you so much, Lola Grace. Lola Grace is a third grader from our church, and she's been in many of my classes, Sunday school and Wednesday night as well. And she did a great job. It was actually a, a long verse, but she did a wonderful job. And I want to thank you for including um, your pup up there <laughs> in the Bible verse, because it's always fun to get a glimpse into our furry friends that uh, are often prayed for in Sunday school. And they always come up whenever it's prayer time, and it's fun to see the... Uh, animal friends that you guys are always talking about. So thank you for sharing that with us. Now, Lola Grace was reading part of the Bible verse that we're going to talk about today from the book of Micah. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you a little bit about who Micah was. Um, and this, this is a, it's a great story of who he was. So listen along, okay? Sometimes we need people to help us see what's going on. It's good when someone points out ways that we can live as God wants, loving and caring for others. Micah was a prophet who helped people see how God wanted them to live together. Micah was from a small village outside Jerusalem. He grew up in a family of farmers. He spent every day in vineyards and fields. Sometimes people in those villages were treated badly by rich, powerful people in the cities. Micah knew this was wrong. He traveled to the big city of Jerusalem and said, God doesn't want rich and powerful people to treat poor or powerless people badly. Images of fields and trees from his village filled his mind. All Micah could think about was all the time he spent plowing and picking the grain with family and friends. When the world is filled with peace, people will beat their weapons into farm tools. No one will make war. They will sit under our grapevines, our fig trees, Micah told the people in Jerusalem. Micah knew what it was like to be poor. He knew deep down inside that it was what it was like to be treated terribly by people who had power and money. He had big ideas about how God wanted people to treat one another. Like other prophets, Micah had a difficult job. He had to speak hard truths to God's people, truths that they did not want to hear about how powerful and rich people treated others unfairly. Micah talked about the destruction that was coming if God's people ignored how God wanted them to treat one another. What God really wanted was for people to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. So Micah was a prophet. Remember how we've talked about a couple of other prophets in the past weeks? Can you think of their names? Elijah and Elisha. Yeah, so Micah is also going to be a prophet, and a prophet is going to tell other people about God. It's going to be kind of like Jesus does. He's going to, they're going to say, this is what God wants. You need to listen. This is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what he's going to do. I want to break down uh, what it is that Micah is talking about. I'm going to read the entire thing to you, and then we're going to, we're going to break it down a little bit more, okay? So if you will listen carefully. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, 
that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vines, and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the same name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I'm I have afflicted. The lame I will make remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion now and forevermore. So what is Micah trying to tell the people of his time? Can you, can you kind of get some hints from those words? He's telling them to make peace and not war. He's telling them that just because you have money or power means that you can't treat other people unfairly or unkindly. And he is longing for the day when everyone will worship the same God and they will love the one true God. Have you ever heard of Zion? It may sound familiar to you. There are lots of hymns and songs written about it. Now, Zion is going to be the hill in Jerusalem on which the city of David was built. But for Christians, we also use that term Zion to mean a heavenly city or the kingdom of heaven, a place of peace and, and a place with God. And that is what Micah is looking forward to. See, Micah didn't have much. He was... Um, he was a son of a farmer. He didn't have very much money. They were very poor. And he was treated badly. And he saw his friends and the people that he loved being treated badly. So as he grew up, he came from those who did not have much. And as, there, as Pastor Jay often says, the least and the last and the lost. So he knows what it feels like to be those people. And he knows that these people need to be... They need to be helped in the sense of their spirit. I'm sure with their things too. They 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 probably need help in 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 their you know with money or with shelter, different things. But they also need to be helped in their spirit. They need to be treated kindly. They need to be treated fairly, and that's what Micah is trying to tell. And a lot of what he has to say is also about um, peacefulness and and not war. So let's. Let's take a part and what, let's see what it is that Micah is, is preaching, what he's, what he's trying to tell the people of his time. So he says, teach us his way so we can walk his paths. So what he's trying to tell them is, oh, so that we can follow God. And we know what that means to follow God, right? To do his will, to listen, to trust and obey and uh, to follow his commandments, to read our Bibles, to pray, to serve the one and only God. So we know what that means, but Micah's looking forward to a day when everyone, everyone will follow God. Okay, let's look at else, what else he's hoping for. He will, and what he says he, God, God will arbitrate between strong nations. So Micah's looking forward to when God will decide the power of the nations, they will be fighting for power, and God will say, "Enough, enough. I am the one true God. You're not going to fight anymore. There's not going to be any battles over power, because there's not going to need to be any battles over power." Micah's looking forward to that time. Let's see what else. He will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So what he's trying to say is that God will turn their weapons, their uh, swords and their spears, into farming tools. So what he is saying is that they will, instead of, instead of destroying with weapons, they will grow. They will grow figs, he says, and vines, vineyards, uh, grapes. They will make something instead of pulling apart something, instead of destroying something. And he later goes on to say, and they will sit under the shade 
of those trees and they will be well rested and they will eat well and they will be happy and fruitful and it will be a good life instead of a hard life of, of war and destruction let's see what else it is that micah wants no one shall make them afraid what he's trying to say is that no one will live in fear any longer what do we get afraid of we might be afraid of someone who's bigger than us or more powerful than us maybe someone who picks on us or who wants to fight us or or constantly threatens to fight us or threatens us in general and so what micah says is this one of these days no one no one will be afraid of anyone any longer because there won't be any reason to fight because god will step in and he will say no no longer okay what else is it that micah is hoping for we will walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever and ever. So what he is saying is that um, back in the Bible times, there were a lot of different people from a lot of different nations and a lot of different groups, and they worshiped different gods, little g, um, gods of fire, gods of water, gods of all sorts of different things. And Micah is looking forward to the day when everybody recognizes the one true God, the Lord of Lords our God, right? And that they throw away these these ideas that there are little mini gods that, that control water and fire and wind and rain because they don't. The one true God is the one who created everything. And so he is looking for that. And he wants to be there the day when we will love and recognize our one true God and live with him eternally. All right, let's see what else Micah is waiting for. He will assemble the lame, gather those who have been driven away, and those afflicted. Oh, Micah, he cannot wait for God to cure and heal and find the broken, the last, and the lost. So there are people, when we say lame, that means maybe people who cannot walk, maybe who do not have use of their limbs, maybe people who cannot see or cannot hear. Uh, who may have lost other senses or abilities to function like everybody else around them. Maybe they can't work or they can't feed themselves or their their bodies are in, are in deterioration. And those who have been driven away, that could be um, where they don't feel wanted or needed or loved. And afflicted, they could be uh, a disease like leprosy, we talked about before um, in Bible times, or other things that would have happened and Micah can't wait for the day when God's going to come and cure and heal and find and make people whole again and everyone will be able to sit at the same table and be whole again and be together again what a wonderful wonderful ah oh, what a wonderful thought that is let's see what else it is that Micah is waiting for the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion so he says, all this is going to happen and God will reign as our God in the heavenly city that we call Zion. Now, if you remember, we talked about Micah. He was from around Jerusalem and Zion, uh, the actual place. And as you can see in the picture, do you see there in the picture? That is an illustration of, Zion, of Mount Zion. Uh, it's a very beautiful place, it looks like there. And uh, that that is the physical place where everyone will be welcomed and everyone will be made whole. And Micah is telling all of these people, this is what we have to look forward to. If you just, if you just listen to me, if you just do what God wants you to do, God wants you to turn away from your, from your wicked ways. He wants you to stop fighting with each other. He wants you to walk in peace. That sounds like wonderful things, doesn't it? Did you know that God has promised us these things? Did you know that? Now, we're not there. We're not there, are we? Do you see, when you look out your window or when you look at the TV, do you see peace and harmony? Like everyone treating everyone wonderfully? No, we're not there yet. But God has indeed promised us these things. Now, before we get on too much further, let's see if we can figure out which part of the Bible the entire book of Micah comes from. Now let's look at a couple of the clues. Um, now so we know it's an entire book of the Bible and so the main character there is Micah and he's talking about Jerusalem and he is talking about Zion and he is talking about people there and he's a prophet 
So based on some of those clues there, uh, can you decide where in the Bible the book of Micah would be? You are correct. Jesus is not in, Micah does not know about Jesus yet. We don't know about Jesus yet. Uh, Micah would be a prophet before Jesus comes. Jesus is going to kind of kind of come and take over Micah's job there and really tell everybody the same things and, and shout louder and um, do those things. But yes, this is in fact the Old Testament. So what do you think of Micah's hope for the future? Is it what you want for the future? Do you think that's what your parents and your grandparents want? Do you think people pray for that? For healing and for no war and for harmony and, and safety and for the least and the last and the lost all, all be returned to wholeness? While Micah was just one man and he did all he could do um, just as God has, had told him to do, to go out and to, and to preach and to tell. He couldn't, he couldn't turn that tide of war and anger. And just like I am one Sunday school teacher, I can't, I can't do that myself either. But when we come together as Christian people, we do a lot of good together. Did you know that? When we get together and we pray together and we work together for good, we really make a difference. Did you know that? Can you think of some ways that we as Christians work together to fulfill what it is that God wants us to do? Can you think of a couple of ways? God asks us to help those who cannot help themselves. We do a lot of things. We do Caritas. We do MSEF. We do Operation Christmas Child. We have missions we do all sorts of things to help as many people as we can help. And you know what we do? Even if we're not doing one of those organizational kind of things, we pray. We pray for people. We pray for people when they ask us. We pray for people even when they don't ask us to do that. We are able to help people just by telling them, you're okay. Jesus loves you. There are lots of little things that we can do to live in to what it is that God and Jesus have called us to do. So I think in a way, while, while what Micah was waiting for hasn't, hasn't come yet, we're living into what it is that he wanted. We're, we're working on it, aren't we? I think all of us are a work in progress. We're, we're humans. We're not there, but what we're working on it. Now, many people who have a hard time believing in God, you know what one of the things they almost always ask? And they say, well, why doesn't your God just come down and fix everything? And it seems like an easy question to ask. Um, you know, why doesn't he just come in and fix it and fix the war and fix the hunger problem? But you know what? We know something that they don't know. We know that God has a plan. We, know, we don't know what his plan is, but we know that there is a plan. We know that God is bigger than us. We know that he knows way more than we can ever comprehend. He has a plan for each of us. We know he loves us unconditionally. We know not to question what it is that he has in store. We know that everything works for his good. We have faith. Even as the small as the mustard seed, we have that faith. And we keep on trying, don't we? I have the perfect song, which I thought was the perfect song to sing to go with our lesson today. So I asked the Sunbeam singers if they would do a rendition of it for you. And they said they would happy to be, they would be happy to do so. So I hope that you will enjoy the song and sing along if you know it, okay?
that song as a child and I and I loved it. Um, I'm not sure if you remembered it or not, but I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Now we talked about Zion being on a hill, or we talked about in Jerusalem on the hill in the city of David. And I thought we might see how many other famous mountains in the Bible we can remember. Are you ready for a little trivia? All right, let's see how many we can get. Are you ready to play? Okay. Noah's Ark will come to rest on this mount after the rains come down for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you remember the name of that mount? Mount Eret. Good job if you got that. Give yourself 10 points. Mount Eret. All right, let's even get the next one. Moses will climb this mountain and talk to God for 40 days, and he will return with the Ten Commandments. See if you can get this one. Mount Sinai. Did you get that one? Another 10 points if you got that one. Good job. This one is much harder. So 15 points if you get this one. Below this mount was the site of Jesus' crucifixion. The mountain was given its name by its skull or face-like resemblance. Oh, can you get this one? Mount Golgotha. Did you get that? Do you remember that one from Easter time? 15 points if you got that one. All right, this one is also a tricky one of the 15 points. It was on this mount that Jesus would weep for Jerusalem. Jesus would also tell his disciples of what will happen to him as his time on earth was drawing to a close. Hmm, you remember this one? It would be the Mount of Olives. You got that one right, give yourself 15 points. All right, this is our super hard 20 point question. Are you ready? On this mountain, the prophet Elijah will take on the prophets of their false god, Baal. Elijah will challenge them to build an altar and to see whom serves the one true God. All right, 20 points if you get this one right, are we ready? You said Mount Carmel. You are correct. 20 points. <laughs> so how did you do? Uh, I thought that might be a little bit of fun. There's actually quite a few mountains that are that are listed in the Bible, um, but I wanted to pull a few from stories that you might that you might remember. But I want you to keep in mind about that Mount Zion, that beautiful, beautiful city of God. Now, today, um, this week as always, we have uh, Ms. Anne Dvorak with her devotion, but she's got a new friend, um, a new animal friend, and she has two new little friends as well. So it's a very exciting day at the farm with Ms. Anne Dvorak. So listen along to her devotion. Hi, everybody. Guess where we are today? We're in the barn. It is sunny and bright, and we have another cookie. This is our new cookie. Avery, can you tell them anything about cookie? Likes to be loved. Well, and I have another guest here with me. Tobias is helping out today. So we're just having a good time. Well, our lesson this week came from the book of Micah. And if you look in the last part of the Old Testament, you find these little books, and they're called Minor Prophets. And what Micah wants, oh, got the wrong glasses. What Micah wants us to do, ask ourselves, is what does the Lord require of you? And this was the answer, or this is the question. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Yes, that's what we need to do. Be kind. Now, we saw how kindness was when Avery patted Cookie and how kind an animal was. Now, something else that's occurring, Tobias has a little pamphlet called Prince of Peace. And when we start our Advent season of the church, that's four weeks before Christmas Day, each of you all can read in here. Can you open it up for us, Tobias, just a little bit so they can see the inside? I, if you hold it. See, there are things for the children and their family to read. There are activities. Lots to do because we're getting ready for Jesus. Life is fun. <laughs> 
Life is so fun and unexpected at times. So always remember, boys and girls, to have the best day you can have. And today I'm having fun with my guest here. To oh, I think he's going to lick Tobias. <laughs> what do you think, Tobias? Okay. Either one would like to say a prayer for us this week? Would you, Tobias? Okay, bow your head. Okay, Tobias. Dear God. Dear God. Help us each day. Help us each day. To be kind. Be kind. Loving. Loving. To everybody. To, loving to everybody. Help us to have a good week. Help us to have a good week. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Avery, can you say amen? Amen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Borak. She has always has wonderful devotions. It, it was it was extra special this week, and it was lots of fun. What do you think of Cookie? She he loved giving kisses to both Avery and Tobias, and there is nothing like a baby cow kiss. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, I hope that your week is as wonderful as Cookie's week and Tobias and Avery's week. I hope that you go out and you enjoy that fall, beautiful, beautiful outside. And I know Thanksgiving is this week, and I know that you are excited about different things that you might do and you don't have a school as much. But I also have something for you this week, the Thanksgiving special edition of Sunday School. I've been working very, very hard on it, and I hope that you will tune in on Wednesday and join me for that special little treat from me to you. So have a good week and make time for God. Make sure you do that, okay? Always be thankful and know that you are loved.